Good morning. Today's lecture is on Friedrich Nietzsche. You've had two lectures and a reminder that the beginning of this semester, the main object of it is for you to proactively yourself get involved with what's happening in the world of astrophysics and the world of evolutionary biology and evolutionary thinking. <coughs> And it would take much more than just a little bit of time at the beginning of this semester for you to really get into it well. It was meant, and hopefully, just to see whether it was successful or not. It should have gotten you, and it's successful only when you yourselves participate in it, it should have gotten you interested in finding out much more about the whole, <coughs> what's happening in astrophysics and what's happening in the world of evolution. Now we take a qualitative leap outside of the world of what's happening in the world of science, smack dab into, right into the heart of the world of social critique, intellectual critique, philosophical critique. And for somebody who is a critic, I doubt you'll find anybody more interesting than Nietzsche. <coughs> Nietzsche, rebelled against practically everything. So if you think he's going to t say things that you like, yes, he's going to say some things you like, but he's going to say a lot of things you don't like, and you might miss the whole point of Nietzsche if you sort of try to make him uh, fit any one particular uh, category or, or way of thinking. So Nietzsche is an extremely interesting way of coming into the world of 204 and the world supposedly more contemporary than the previous 201, 202, 203, although everything in those courses should be contemporary if you took, took them properly, they're still alive. But now with the world of critique, you have the world of capitalism and the world of socialism and the world of Marxism, <laughs> you have feminism and you have utilitarianism and you have all kinds of uh, ideologies fl flying about. And Nietzsche comes in and is not happy with any of them. And he's an extremely interesting person because the way he approaches it is very provocative. So he isn't coming and sort of giving you a nice, simple, let's sit down and look at all this rationally and look at it you know, carefully and precisely. He wants to, uh, he wants to shock you. So if you're reading Nietzsche and you're comfortable, then I don't think Nietzsche would be happy. So when you read Nietzsche, you know, and you, it takes time to get into him and understand what he's doing, but his primary purpose in life was to provoke people out of their comfort zones, out of the belief that they could fit into some nice little niche, some ism, some belief system, and that they could live their lives that way. So let me see what I can do for you. The fly sheets you have, the first page is all that I'm going to be really dealing with. You can separate it really from the others. The others are, I, I downloaded the slides that I will be showing here. Just in case I don't have time to go through everything that's on this presentation. And I remind you, the presentations are on the web. But they, you have them there on, your, uh, on, on the handout for today. On the very first page, Friedrich Nietzsche, behold the man. Let me tell you where I get this from. One of the books he wrote is called Ecce Homo, Behold the Man. And this is Nietzsche. He, was, you know, he takes things that uh, can seem simple on, on the outside. But if you don't know something of the history of thought and, and the history of society and politics in the Western world, it's hard to really understand what he's saying. And so you wind up with some kind of superficial view of what he is saying. Behold, the man for him was the heart of what he was trying to do in his life. What is it to be a human being? So his uberman, you know, the superman, the overman, is a, a model for everything that he came to understand, to think that that's what we should be aiming for. This is how we should be living our life. So Behold the Man, the title of one of his last books that he wrote, is taken from much of what had influenced him, him his Christianity, because he was a Lutheran, and as a young man he was, uh, he was Christian. <clears throat> And then when he decided to leave his Christianity, uh, Ecce Homo, of course, comes from you know, the story of Jesus and Pilate, and when the, uh, the Jewish establishment wants to crucify him, 
uh, and they take him to the Roman Pilate, and the Roman Pilate doesn't want to crucify him because he gets impressed with the man. And so uh, he, take, he has him tortured, and then he brings him out, hoping that the people, the, the people will have pity on him and not force Pilate to kill him. And so he brings, he brings him out and, and in the Latin says, Ecce homo, behold the man. So taking it from, his, from the Christian world, this notion, behold the man. Now for the Christian world and the world of Europe that he was living in, you know, when you want to know something about humanity, you, you, prime, you look at Jesus. All right? Jesus is the representative for the Christian world of true humanity, the fullness of humanity. So behold what is true humanity. Now, as Nietzsche goes away from his Christianity and starts to want to develop his own understanding, once again, it's still the same thing. We want to know what is a good model for us as a human being. In Europe of the 19th century, uh, with all the discoveries, there was Darwinism and there was communism and there was all this stuff happening. We want to know, you know, who are we? As a, and there was capitalism and there was the soft supermarket world of today. It was already beginning then. Uh, what does it mean to really be fully a human being? So the title of the lecture is Behold the Man. Hopefully by the end of this lecture, I'll have at least been able to introduce you a little bit to this very fascinating figure in, its, in his diversity and away from putting him into any pigeonhole and trying to, you know, people like to adopt him and become their thinker. So I'll go through the fly sheet with you so as to give you some uh, development. Radical critique. Okay, we, you come into university, they tell you we want to teach you to be a critical thinker. Well, critical thinker can mean many, many things, and critical thinker can simply be being a, a, you know, a critic, and you're just nagging, and you don't, you know, you think you're very clever because you've discovered somebody has made a contradiction, or, you know, critical can mean something very simple, uh, simplistic, and silly, but critical can mean, you know, what it meant for Socrates and what it's meant all through, looking at a very, looking much more deeply into things and understanding them much more deeply before you accept or reject. So critical thinking doesn't mean learning to reject. It means learning to think much more deeply, to understand things in, 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 in its various dimensions, and getting away from superficiality. If you take a look at the very bottom line of the, of the page here, simplify and falsify. One of the things that he stresses is that as human beings, we, because we need to understand things and things are so complex around us, we need to simplify. Right? If we don't simplify, we won't be able to understand. I'm sorry to interrupt you in the back room. You know, I know I hate to interrupt people when they're speaking. I hope I'm not bothering you. Yeah, but okay, thank you. Um, my mommy told me never interrupt people when they're speaking. Sorry, I'm a good boy. So basically here, the, uh, a, a criti this criticism, becoming critical, means to get out of your own cave and out of your own little island and out of your silly discussing with each other instead of listening to something and trying to learn something at university or your mobiles if anybody's still on their mobile and really start to try to take seriously life around you okay behold the man you want to know who you who you are as a human being and to understand that you've got to take life a bit more seriously and this was this was Nietzsche he took life perhaps too seriously so he wound up going mad put into a mad asylum <coughs> And so, you know, the, the, this, is, this is the fascinating uh, person who is Nietzsche. But basically, a radical critique means looking at your civilization, <clears throat> looking at your, your religion, looking at your philosophy, looking at all the latest things, and trying to understand them very well so that you can then criticize. So criticize doesn't mean meaning negate. It means to f appreciate, understand, put yourself in the place of others, widen your horizons, Empathy, first of all, and then reflect upon by rejecting something, accepting something, asking questions. This was the model of, of somebody who was like that, Nietzsche, as far as I am concerned. Why do I say at the top of the page, prophet of a dying civilization? See, in this course, we don't teach you Nietzsche as you might take him in a philosophy course. We'd waste your time. We don't give you any one particular social theory view of Nietzsche or something like that. We try as much as possible to give you the broadest picture of this person in a non-specialized way. Prophet of a dying civilization, what does that mean? After I've tried to tell you about behold the man, he's talking about who you are as a human being and what you would need to do to discover what it was. You don't just look at the person of Jesus as the Christians did and sort of follow 
in a simplistic way. You have to get, you have to look at it much, much more seriously and look at your own life and see what you accept, what you don't accept, and see if you're understanding it properly. Behold the man. Understand yourself seriously. But the civilization he was living in, a dying civilization. He, ahead of others, that's why he's considered a prophet in this secular sense of prophet. He saw what was going to be happening in the 20th century well ahead of when it started. He, he could see it starting, all the, the, all the wonderful things that happened in the 20th century, the world wars, the, the crash of the capitalist market, uh, the, the, the consumer mentality of people becoming more and more soft and more and more just concerned for getting more money and more success and more of this. For him, the civili his civilization represented something wonderful, something great. He went back to the Greeks to see how much wonderful things there were already there in the Greeks. Even when he was attacking Christianity, he was, he was living the Christian spirit himself in terms of its best understanding. So he was, he was looking at the civilization, looking at his fellow Christians, and it's said that he looked at, you know, he'd tell his Christians, he says, you know, if you really believe in a Christ, in a Jesus, in a, in a Redeemer, I want to see him in your life. You know, you're, you're all dead. You know, he, he came that they may have life and have it more abundant. This was the slow, you know, this Jesus bringing life. Well, if you're followers of Jesus, you know, you're all you're a bunch of dead people. You're hypocritical. You're using religion just, to, just for success or social standing. Uh, the, the whole hip hypocritical thing was he, he found his civilization die in a beginning to die and as you go through 204 you're going to see freud and then you're going to see twilight uh the, the, sorry the death in death in venice which is again question of death the twilight of a civilization so in this part of the course you need to see what people were responding to when Supposedly, a great civilization was starting to decay, starting to become soft, starting to become mediocre, starting to just care about you know, the comfort zone and all of this. The, the, what I have on the, the, the BGE means the, is the book you have, Beyond Good and Evil. And 224 means aphorism 20, 224, because this is not a, a classical philosophical term. It's aphorisms, things to make you think. All right, and in reading them, all right, it's supposed to provoke you and make you think about whatever he's talking about. You know? So it's not just a simple philosophical treatise. It's an attempt to provoke a whole civilization to wake up, a wake-up call. The civilization is dying. All your isms are just nothing. They're just becoming very, very shallow. And people jump on them, and people become herd sheep in a bad sense, because sheep are nice people, you know, but herd, you know, just, just sort of follow the leader and not think much, you know. And therefore, his, his main topic for morality is slave and master. So everything you're doing, finally, if you once you understand Nietzsche, can be understood by his standards, of course. So either you're living like a slave or you're living like a master, all right? And we all do both, but, you know, the purpose is to start to understand my own slavery, you know, Plato, if you took Plato, you should have by now, but I guess you don't anymore in CVSP. The cave, we're all like in a cave, and we need a shock to get us to come out of the shock. We need a Nietzsche to shock us out of the cave, right? Well, this is what he was trying to do in his own day, shock the people of the cave of his day to come on out. So uh, the, he was criticizing the, 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 the shallow uh, Christianity of his day. <laughs> he was criticizing... Uh, the Platonism, not Plato, and I would really beg you not to think that you're going to understand Plato by reading, just as I don't think you're going to understand Christianity by reading Nietzsche, or you're going to understand Plato by reading Nietzsche. You'll understand Nietzsche. Plato was, had his own world, his own thinking, etc. Platonism became the popular way of philosophizing for many, many people in his day. So he aims his attack primarily on Platonism. So Christianity, Platonism, and the third one is democracy. Everybody's talking about democracy. It wasn't like today when the world is fully democratic. Mahek, when somebody talks about democracy today, they, they mean it. I mean, society is functioning like a good democracy, Mahek. You know, democracy has always been a challenge because people would like to live that way, but then you have two problems. One of them is simply the hypocrisy of people pretending to be democ democratic. You know, we want to make the world more democratic, and then they split up all of the Middle East, in, the late, in our own history now, okay? We're going to bring democracy to the Middle East. So what do they do? They get everybody fighting each other religiously, because that's the easiest way to get them to fight, you know, in the name of democracy. If you're not, if you're, if you're not aware of these things, you can't understand a Nietzsche, all right? 
He was looking at what was happening in his day that's similar to what's happening in our day. There's so much hypocrisy in the name of slogans. You know, Christianity, uh, Platonism, uh, democracy, feminism, uh, Marxism, communism, socialism, ism, 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 you see? And you can feel comfortable because you, you pick the politically correct one for the day and you join it and you become, you know, you're really something, okay? Now, this is the kind of phenomenon he was attacking. So, a many faceted phenomenon. <clears throat> Let me now try to take you a little bit more. Uh, that's why I have that picture there. Who is he? Nietzsche. There are many Nietzsches. <clears throat> the tragic trajectory of the prophet of a dying civilization. His work is a tragedy. A great man, but not rewarded. Right? He winds up being mad. Being a prisoner with, first of all, his sister, with his mother, and then his sister. <clears throat> and his sister abuses him fully in terms of intellectual abuse. So, what is Nietzsche? <clears throat> Some people deify him. They become Nietzscheans. He becomes their god. Some people think he's a devil, demon. Some people think he's an angel of light, but that has two items. Angel of light in the scriptures means a false angel. <laughs> so is he an angel of light or is he a Satan seeming like an angel? Is he a genius? Is he a madman? Is he a prophet seeing things that other people hadn't seen ahead of time? Or is he simply like the topic the title of one of his books, Human, All Too Human. So all these great gods of the latest thing, you know, T human, you know, don't, don't let them be gods, you know. Look at them in their, all of their humanity, learn from them, but don't worship anybody. So and Nietzsche certainly would not want himself to be worshipped, as he has become sometimes, uh, Nietzsche. He was a tortured soul. He was a god seeker and a god killer at the same time. He never sets himself free from Christ. Uh, Christ was his obsession. All right? Why was I not Christ? I mean, uh, if there was a Christ, I should be a Christ. If there is a God, I should be a God. I mean, this, this became, all of this is sort of, you know, very uh, poetic. It's not, if you take him literally, you, you miss the point. He was a tortured soul. He was really seeking something. He was uh, disgusted with what was happening around him. Uh, he was a God killer in the sense of killing any stupid ideas about the divine. These are four books that are useful uh, that, that influenced me. Uh, the last name, Peter Bornadal, our own professor here, of course, is, uh, does a lot of work on Nietzsche and in terms of how Nietzsche can be, you can get philosophical themes out of Nietzsche and develop them in a traditional uh, philosophical way. Um, Kaufman and Reinhardt and Barrett are people who uh, trans translated him, Kaufman. <coughs> Reinhardt, in a book, uh, I've given you the names later, is an excellent book on the whole of the mood in the 20th century where Nietzsche fit in. Uh, Reinhardt's book and Barrett another one. Um, I, I thought I had, the, here they are, The Existential Revolt by Kurt Reinhardt. You have them on your, the references there if you want to ever look them up. A wonderful introduction to some of the great thinkers of the 20th century in a, in a very interesting human and uh, a way that a layman can understand. Irrational man. Peter Bornadal, our own professor, has written a number of works on Nietzsche, The Surface and the Abyss, it gives you a good understanding of Nietzsche. Read him on the surface, you miss him. The Surface and the Abyss, you know, and this was what Nietzsche was all talking about, simplifying and falsifying. That we simplify because we have to simplify in order to understand things, but we need to continue to remember that as we are trying to understand things, we necessarily are simplifying and therefore falsifying as long as we remember, there's no problem. But as soon as we think we're doing a full, absolute study on that thing, and we forget that we're only dealing with it partially, and it's very important what we're dealing with, we can deal with very clearly. But as soon as we forget, we, as we are the animal, not just the rational, we are the rational animal who uses reason to simplify things so that we can understand and survive and get along. In simplifying, we falsifying. The critical thinker will always be criticizing themselves and reminding themselves, Habibi, this is just one aspect. You know, the, I'm, I'm losing something when I, put, when I codify it. So simplifying and the surface and the abyss. Don't forget that there's an abyss behind anything serious that you're looking at, which is meant to challenge you to go on looking for it. Don't think you've reached it because you have a slogan about it or a book about it. Um, Beyond Good and Evil is the book we are using, BGE. All right. Um, philosophy as autobiography is a, a main item here. Uh, he 
considers in as one of your, if you look at, at the Nietzschean hammer, the first item there, perspectivism, philosophy as autobiography. From, in aphorism six, you'll see it in your text. Perspectivism. Perspectivism does not mean relativism. It doesn't mean everything is relative. It just means you need to be aware that you are looking at things just like everybody else is looking at things from your own perspective, which is a broad field. It's not just relativism that, you know, my idea is just as good as your idea. No, there are very good reasons why you have your perspective. And you need to understand the very good reasons why somebody else might have that perspective. So it's not to, not to make, not to tell you that everything is relative, so yalla, you can just do whatever you like, and uh, each human being determines what's truth, sophism. No, he's telling you life is much more serious, and you have to put your life behind it. Your philosophy, what you believe in, should always be backed by your own life. So he claims that philosophy is autobiography. Philosophy, genuine, for all philosophy is simply telling you, you know, the, what that particular person is, uh, uh, the life of that person. But it can be very negative, it can be very silly, and can be very serious. It means, you know, something serious, if it really has the whole life of somebody behind him and the whole culture behind him, is going to be a much more interesting philosophy. So depending on whose autobiography it is, it's going to be much more interesting. But the point here is, philosophy is not just abstract. Philosophy is existential. Philosophy is connected to life. And so philosophy has to use reason and abstraction and simplifying and theory and speculation, but it must always be tested by life. So your life has to be put behind your philosophy. Nietzsche called, if you took Goethe in, in 203, and you may never have had 203, uh, Nietzsche calls Goethe's letters to Eckermann the best German book because you know, Goethe was not Faust. In his letters to Eckermann, you get a lot of Goethe's life. And so you see why Goethe was writing Faust and how Faust was developing as a work over parts one and part two. And you get the, you get the autobiography of Goethe that then gives you uh, the true understanding of what Goethe means, not just his character Faust or just the, you know, the character Faust. Anyway, some of his great books that are popular, of course, thus spake Zarathustra, Eke Homo, all right? Augustine, Goethe, Nietzsche are in this realm of philosophizing. Okay? Outside of specialized philosophy, their philosophy is their way of thinking about life is existential, combining the best of the mind and reason and abstraction with life. The references, brief biography, these are all there for you, but you know, from 1844 to 1900, spanning that 56 years, <coughs> uh, Lutheran family, etc. there, a brilliant fellow, student, etc. Uh, appointed chair of classical philology in 1869, awarded his doctorate from Leipzig without examination, a brilliant man. 72 publishes his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, looking more deeply into the whole of the past of the Greek world and tragic world. Uh, resigns his post in 79, mental, followed by physical collapse in 1889, and dies in 1900. Major works, just the titles themselves are useful. The birth of tragedy, human, all too human. The joyful wisdom, not just wisdom, but the joyful wisdom. Joy, very important part, life and joy. All right, this is the stuff he gets from his Christianity. I mean, everything in the New Testament and Jesus is about life and joy, not about religion or about uh, what things sometimes people uh, boil them down to. Wisdom has to be joyful. Thus spake Zarathustra, the will to power. Very important. We'll come now to this in a little while to see why that's so important. What does he mean by the will to power? Beyond good and evil, what does that mean? on the genealogy of morals. The Antichrist, he saw himself, and he wrote one of his last books, he called himself the Antichrist, Eke Homo, Twilight of the Idols. These are all titles of his book. This is the one we're reading, Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. <clears throat> this is what he was looking forward to, finding a philosophy that's going to be different from all of the stuff that's around, that, that people are kind of worshipping and, and just simply repeating without really thinking seriously about. He wants a fresh new philosophy that really brings in joy and life and, and, and challenge and suffering and not being afraid to, you know, to, to pay the price away from the softness of the Western world that was becoming the capitalistic world of you know, numbers and money and profit and, uh, and all of this. Mm. 
he's influenced many people. These are just some of the people he's influenced. In Eke Homo, again, you know, I just want to throw out some things at you to understand the man. That's my, all I have time for in this thing. In Eke Homo, he divides it into four sections. And he calls it, one of the first one, why I am so wise. Why I am so prudent. Why I am writing such excellent books. Why I am a fate. You see, if you just read that superficially, you think this guy is, يعني, he's saying this guy is paranoid. You know, why I am so wise. Now, but the point of it, and in, in the, the other quotations, is try to help you, to give you background. Finally, Eke Homo, the man. What he's trying to tell you is, look at what I'm trying to tell you through my works, and through what I'm doing, and through my provoking you to get some light about what, what humanity is all about. What should a human being be like? How should you live your life? So wisdom, prudence, excellence, and destiny, and the future are all wrapped up in your understanding of the human being. And so he is offering us a fresh candidate for accepting what humanity should look like. <clears throat> but if you just look at the titles, you can, you know, and you don't know Nietzsche, you can know this guy, why I am so wise, Habibi, uh, Salam Asmak. But you know, if you understand what he's saying, he's trying to, to provoke you into uh, looking for, in your own life to make your own life a bit more serious. Some quotations from him, very interesting. His war strategy to attack only matters that are victorious, only where he stands alone without any allies, never to attack persons but to use them only as a huge magnifying glass to make visible some creeping but as yet intangible crisis. Something's happening where you can see it best if you put it into people. So when he attacks people, don't take it so seriously that, you know, Plato is really like that or Christ is really like that or, or any of the people he's attacking, you know. He's using these for you to see something of, uh, of, of what you should be looking at. But to attack only matters that are victorious, <clears throat> okay, uh, Self-evaluation. I have contradicted as no one has dared contradict. Nevertheless, the opposite of a spirit of negation. He's not a nihilist. He's not a negator. He means to, to provoke you so that you will wake up and do something. The bearer of glad tidings. I'm a yay-sayer, not a nay-sayer, with whom the hope of the human race has been restored. This is how he understood himself. Let's take a look a little bit about the man. Stuff you'll never really get. All this you can get in a great book like Existential Revolt, where he puts a lot of his own, a lot of Nietzsche's own words about himself. A man of spiritual depth needs friends, unless he still has God as a friend. I have neither God nor friends. See, the aloneness. He allowed himself to become isolated, because he didn't want to become part of the herd. He didn't want to be PC. He didn't want to be politically correct. He didn't want to just follow the latest uh, stuff like that. But he paid a heavy price for it. He became quite isolated. For thus it has always been and thus it will always be. One cannot aid a cause more effectively than by persecuting it, by hunting it with all hounds. This I have done. He thought he was helping Christianity. He was helping anything serious that he was attacking. People don't get that point if they don't read into everything he was doing. All alone with myself, I am in danger of losing myself in a forest. I need help, I need disciples, I need a teacher, a master. I should find it sweet to obey if only I could find someone capable of clarifying for me the value of our moral ideas. But I find no one, no disciples to say nothing of teachers. Now these two incidents I have at the bottom here are very interesting. They really, I found them very interesting when I was your age, when I first read this stuff. <coughs> to see what kind of a human he was. <coughs> On a Sunday morning, you know, in Germany, in Lutheran Germany, people go to church. And so this student came by and saw him and greeted him and said, of course, you're going to church, Mr. Nietzsche, Professor Nietzsche. And so he was walking with his friend and he tells her, yes, yes, of course. And of course, the friend is an atheist. And so he looks at Nietzsche, he says, sure hypocrisy, why are you telling me you're going to church? So he says, he, he answers, he says, not every truth is for everyone. If I had troubled the heart of this young girl, I should have felt disconsolate. You know, a critic isn't somebody who just goes around, you know, sort of getting everybody messed up without giving them something. You know, he was dealing with the highest people of his day. He was only attacking the victorious, only the people who were in charge of the universities, only the people in charge of society, only the people who really thought they were the big uh, heads of everything. So he, he didn't just go around trying to disturb people and make them lose their faith or something because he wanted to be a militant atheist and you know, get everybody to be like himself. Uh, and again, with, in Florence, he, has a, he goes in and meets an astronomer. When he comes out, he says, 
I wish this man had not read my books. He's too good. My influence on him could be very disastrous. I hope you're noticing the, the nuance in the human there. He, he, he has a message. He wants to do something. He wants to provoke. He wants to reform. But he's not uh, a silly reformer, a silly militant, somebody who just wants to preach his own uh, particular philosophy to you. He's, he, he's, he's sensitive. You know, he's empathetic. He puts himself in the place of each of the people he's dealing with. With people who are not, don't think of themselves as fuzzy. He leaves them alone. Those who do think they're fuzzy, you know, okay, that's like Socrates. He went around to Athens to all the, to the big shots, you know, when Apollo says he's the wisest man. He goes around to all of them and discovers in examining with them that they don't, they are ignorant, but they don't know they're ignorant. But the, the big shots is what, you know, a, a serious critic uh, and reformer deals with, not just, you know, upsetting everybody. <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, something, when he was leaving his belief in God, <clears throat> he had a very passionate relationship with God, <coughs> and <coughs> he, continued, he never lost this. He had a love-hate relationship with Christ, and therefore with God, and therefore with, with that. Without the Christian faith, you will be to yourself a monster and a chaos. He underlined these words in 1885, near the end of his life, when he was re reading something from Pascal. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so he was very much aware that it's not that simple, the Christian faith or not the Christian faith, you know, belief or atheism. It's not, you know, a simple, hey, choose one uh, thing there. If there were gods, how could I bear it not to be a god? Therefore, there are no gods in Zarathustra. You know, this is a provocative statement. I believe in the ancient Germanic saying, all the gods must die. And you see, gods comes to mean for him everything that sort of enslaves people. So they stop thinking freely. They stop acting freely. They just start worshiping. This idol, this belief, Freud, Hawking, Nietzsche, uh, myself, of course, you're right to worship me, you'll be right there. But you, know, you find somebody, and, you know, and you, you, this, this, this desire, you know, the human creating gods in his own image. So you make out of Freud a god rather than looking at him as a human being. You make out of Nietzsche a god rather than looking, or you know, the latest whatever it is that is your god. So this is the meaning of gods in Nietzsche, really. Don't take them in a... Uh, and, and the madman, this, is, this, is, this affected Gibran's uh, uh, in the prophet. Uh, the madman, and that's all there. I don't have time to read it for you, but you, you, you'll, you in joyful wisdom, Ephraim 125, you can look it up on, on the web if you ever want to look at it. <coughs> Uh, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Yet his shadow still looms. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? See, for him, atheism wasn't the garden variety atheism that you usually come in touch with. His atheism was extremely serious. You want to be an atheist, you have to be God. You really believe there's no God, then, you, then if, you're, if you still want to be a full human being, take responsibility. Don't eliminate God so that you can eliminate responsibility understand what true atheism means. True atheism, you really believe there's no God, then you better do something for humanity. You have to be an Oedipus, you have to be a Prometheus, going back to the, the Greek legends of that, that, that were at the heart of all of this. <coughs> Love, hate with, uh, with Christ. Thus the cycle began and it goes on. Where will it end? After having run the full course, whither are we to turn? Perhaps we will have to make a new start with faith as towards the end of his life, perhaps a Catholic faith. And he never, it wasn't simple atheism. You know, it was really an, a critical investigation of what do these things stand for, how are they being lived, what do they really mean. Christ, the only Christian, a new way of life that was to bring peace and harmony to the human soul so that the pacified soul might then affect the transfiguration of all things. And then uh, I call Christianity the one great curse, <clears throat> the one immortal mark of shame of the human race in his book, The Antichrist. I hope I shall never show myself ungrateful to Christianity, for I owe to it the best experiences of my childhood. You, had the, you always had the, the two old. Can anyone imagine anything that equals in miraculously enchanting force the symbol of the Holy Cross? Nothing equals in impressive strength that paradox of a crucified God, a God crucifying himself for the salvation of men. This sign and symbol triumphs eternally over any other ideal. You see, it was not simple. Trying to understand what these things mean and get the life that's in them and not get just the, you know, the, the folklore. 
In his last days, he started to have hallucinations of the dual presence of Dionysus and Christ, gradual loss of identity. He started to sign letters on costly papers to Strin Arthur Strindberg, the great uh, dramatist. He, he signed it, Nietzsche Caesar, to the Pope and the, po the Papal Secretary of State and the King of Italy. He would sign it, the Crucified. He identified himself with Christ. To others, Dionysus, for those who know Greek uh, mythology. Incident with an abused horse, to show you the person. And this horse was being flogged. Somebody was mistreating it. So he runs off and he, you know, he grabs it. This is how an artist pictured this. You know. So he was always very, very sensitive. You know, and this perhaps is one of the reasons why he went mad also. He put too high a standard for himself to live by. Uh, because, and, but he was extremely a extremely sensitive person, transformed into the jewel deity. <clears throat> Towards the end of his life, piano improvisation and singing. Somebody found him improvising on a piano and singing and reported it in this way. <clears throat> We heard sublime, wonderfully visionary, and unspeakably horrible things being said about himself as he was singing, as the successor of the dead God. <clears throat> he went into an asylum in January 1889, assigned to his mother in March 97. His mother died, and then the horrible time for him was when he was assigned to his sister from 97 until his death. And this is why, uh, if you came in earlier, this is what he said about his sister. His sister took what Nazis did with Nietzsche and started to make out of Nietzsche a Nazi. And his sister, wanting to get power with the Nazis who were starting at the time, tried to pretend that Nietzsche was a Nazi because <clears throat> he was, you know, in a, he, he, he couldn't move, he couldn't express himself. So he wrote her this letter. <clears throat> you have committed one of the greatest stupidities for yourself and for me. Your association with an anti-Semitic chief expresses a foreignness to my whole way of life. He's not anti this or anti that. He's talking about humanity, <coughs> uh, which fills me again and again with ire or melancholy. It's a matter of honor with me to be absolutely clear and unequivocal in relation to anti-Semitism, namely opposed to it as I am in my writings. Nazism, of course, you know, anti-everybody, that's not Aryan, not just. My disgust with this party, which would like the benefit of my name only too well, is as pronounced as possible, and that I am unable to do anything against it, that the name of Zarathustra is used in every anti-Semitic correspondence sheet has almost made me sick several times. This is the, the man, and that's, you know, there, it's important to know the man. Philosophy is autobiography, he says. <laughs> it's very important to understand that. Now, let's, let's try to look at some of the points under Nietzschean hammer. These are, you know, I wish I had enough time to talk about them, but they're sort of, for my mind, this is kind of a number of topics that you really have to understand and put all together to, to really understand Nietzsche. Because you can take one of these or two of these or three of these and, and specialize on some of them and to make Nietzsche what you want him to be. If you look at all of these, just, just this uh, list of items there and you understand them well, you'll get a much better picture of the greatness of this man's thought and his life. So perspectivism I have covered. Philosophy as autobiography. It's my perspective, but my perspective is my life. My life is what I should be ready to die for, not just to preach, you know, but to actually live. <clears throat> Anti-enlightenment. If you took 203, the early modern period, the period of the Enlightenment and Nahda, it, it had become, unfortunately, without 203, in 204 we have to fill in so much from the past. The Enlightenment then engendered the counter-enlightenment, but enlightenment meant primarily becoming more and more computer-like. Science and math and everything that it can do, that's what the world is all about. We are simply advanced computers. The best way to seek knowledge is either using the mathematical or the scientific way. People reacted against it, of course, all from the beginning. But Nietzsche was now attacking it with a focus on some of the points he was dealing with here. The Enlightenment came to mean for him <clears throat> ideology, Platonism, Christianism, Kantianism, utilitarianism, socialism, feminism, and unfortunately, after him, Nietzscheanism. As if you could put something just into rationalistic language and put it into, you know, and sell it, you package it, you know, a recipe, a prescription. <laughs> so basically, he was anti all of these things, focused on his polemic against Plato and Christianity, 
basically both of them, by the way, his attack on both of them is that they, tend, they seem to be making people run away from reality into soporific mediocrity. They, they, for him, they were tending to become recipes for how you can live a good, soft, happy, soporific, non-thinking, mediocre kind of life in search of authentic humanity, a human spring. The Ubermensch, the super famous Superman, is the search for the man, Eke Homo, the real humanity. What is that to be like? Um, Revaluation of value is very, very important. Beyond good and evil means, you know, you're going to eventually be using the good and evil moralities of your cultures. You're not going to invent a new one for yourself. But beyond really means you need to look at them critically, revalue them, give them life. If you find they're dead in there, find a different system. Okay? Revalue your values. You should, this, you should be doing that all the time. It doesn't mean neglect, you know, throw away your values, but keep them serious. Keep them under, you know, looking at what's happening in life with, as you use them, beyond the ordinary conventional understanding of good and evil, an uncritical adherence to conventional morality, master morality as opposed to slave and herd morality. But will to power, if you... It's you know, underneath revaluation of values. The will to power now is his opposition to the enlightenment. The enlightenment, supremacy of reason. Reason came to mean mathematical and, and scientific and quantifiability. All right? <coughs> Anti the enlightenment for him meant bring back the will, bring back instinct, bring back life, bring back joy, bring back adventure, bring back risk, bring back life. All right? The romantics had already been talking about this, of course. And so, basically, the will to power goes beyond the supremacy of reason, not against it. And this is very important. He is not against reason. He was all for science and all the discoveries of science and all that. But don't worship science. Scientism, that's the popular thing of the day today. Science is so wonderful that people then start to worship it as if it's a god in itself, and they lose it. They lose science. It becomes an ideology. Scientism, uh, forms of beliefs based on scientism are just... Ideologies, they're not really science at all. So the will to power for him meant the will to create meaning. Don't just accept, think meaning is going to give it to you. You know, just you know, flow through life. Your family will give it to you. Your religion will give it to you. Your university will give it to you. Your, you know, no, no, no. You have to create in this sense of create. It means you have to give life to whatever it is you're living by. So the will to power is not the power of the Nazis. That's what his sister helped them to say. Will to power for him never meant power. He was against the Germans. He loved the French because he, f he thought the Germans were, were too hicky, power hungry, uh, power, and just in, in, in one, set, one level. But basically, the, the will to power is the will to create meaning, to give meaning to life. You have to do it. You have to put yourself into it. You have to be critical. You have to suffer. He said, I'm not worried about suffering. Don't talk to me about happiness. I don't want happiness if happiness is what you all are trying to get, all right? I want excellence. I want the uberman. I want humanity to progress. I want evolution. With evolution, he says, unlike what Darwinism has told you, the survival of the fittest, he said, when I look around me, I see the survival of the unfittest. It's the mediocre who are surviving. Anytime somebody excellent comes, they tear him down. Democracy, democracy, instead of being a, a, a medium for excellence, has become a medium for just letting, you know, the lowest common denominator and sort of, you know, stuff like that. So the will to power is an extremely important aspect of what he, he says. All life is a will to power. So whatever gives life, that's, what, that's how you should measure your values by are your values leading you to have more life, more joy, more freedom? Or are your values restraining you, restricting you, making you more like a herd, more like a slave, more like a sheep? Are you afraid of solitude? Well, nobody likes solitude. As he says, he found it very, very, uh, very much misery, the solitude. But he preferred the solitude rather than just joining a group, just to be a groupie, a herd, the herd morality. So he's master and slave morality. The, acid, the, the point behind all of the stuff there and you can't understand him without understanding the history of philosophy. Unfortunately, that's why reading him is difficult. But basically, anything that makes you a sheep, a herd, a follower, and uh, is, is what is slave, slave morality, the morality of slaves. Master morality is that which gives life, which you know, gives cr creativity, which gives new things, which brings in true evolution into something that's higher. 
survival of the unfittest, eternal recurrence, leveling. All these are very important terms, and I'm sure I don't have too much time to go into them in detail, but let me make a few comments on the leveling towards the bottom of the page. Ressentiment, resentment in English, but ressentiment has more than just what we mean by resentment. It's kind of a, a sort of envy when you don't have power. So when you don't have power, you pretend to agree with people and all of this. But, you know, it's, but basically, your spirit is one of envy. And you just want to wait for the moment when you can bring them down and take their place. And so a lot of life is envy for him. Christianity had become envy. The slave envying the master. And so, and so understanding Christianity in a slave way. <coughs> Uh, basically here the, the leveling is also in terms of democracy, bringing everything down to your own level. Here I love the uh, story of the crabs, not the story, but if you, those of you who live with crabs, if you get some crabs and you put them into a bucket, and the crabs start to climb up and try to leave, all right? One of them starts to come up and is about to leave. What do the other crabs do? I pull him down! <laughs> they pull the crab down. Right? This is kind of an image in the animal world of, of envy. Uh, this crab is going to get free, but uh, if it's not me, I'm going to pull you down. So this is the, the whole, what he felt was starting to hit, come into Western culture, this whole leveling instinct in the name of democracy. So when he attacks democracy, he's not attacking the best understandings of democracy. Just like when he's attacking Platonism, he's not attacking the best things of Plato. Like when he's attacking Christianity, he's not the best things of that. When he's attacking feminism, it doesn't mean there shouldn't be any, any serious concern for, for human rights and, and for that. He's talking about the way humans create idols, and basically their whole spirit is not a search for excellence, but it's really just a search for getting their own way, the hammer. So he, he calls his philosophy one of the, a, a, the philosoph philosophizing with a hammer. And so he would be the first to want to hammer Nietzscheanism. If any of you think you're going to become a Nietzschean and think he's going to be happy, he would hammer that. Revaluation, a return to meaning from the morass of slogans. If what is mean and mediocre and hypocritical and reductive is that's what people are calling truth, then the only appropriate response is to value untruth. You see, it's not the words that are important. It's what's behind the words. What do they represent? If reason means the deadly, lifeless, academic abstraction, then rescue desire, rescue life. <coughs> Truth and untruth. The falseness of a judgment is to us not necessarily an objection to a judgment. The question when you're judging something is, to what extent is it life advancing, life preserving, species preserving, perhaps even species breeding? You know, truth and untruth are not just sort of things you can do in a logic class and uh, think you're so clever. <laughs> Reevaluating. If love is a warm feeling, if that's what Christianity has become, a, a, a warm feeling rather than the love of Christ and sacrifice and die for, for your fellow man, then selfishness, maybe selfishness is better than love. If community means soporific conformity, doing like what everybody else does, then long live isolation and solitude. If humility means hypocritical ressentiment, you pretend to be humble when you're weak, <laughs> but as soon as you have power, you then, you know, your true self shows. Then long live pride. If pride means being objective, being, you know, uh, taking life seriously and responsibly, then pride is better than, if that's how you mean these words, you see. This is the meaning of reevaluating. Words can become, you know, hide uh, horrible things behind them if you're not looking at them critically. If pleasure means happiness, and happiness is pleasure, then for God's sake, he would say, bring on suffering. Suffering will make a human out of you more than pleasure. It doesn't mean seek suffering. It means, you know, don't, don't be afraid of suffering. Be afraid of being mediocre. Be, be afraid of a slob, being a slob. The will to power replacing supremacy of reason. A living thing desires above all to vent its strength. Life, as su not strength, physical strength, the Nazi. Life as such is will to power. <clears throat> the thirst for life abundant, masters versus slaves. Ye masters... A yay say is not just always na 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 na. Excellence, not mediocrity. Masters, not slaves and herd, taking responsibility for life and noble, not mean and servile and slavish and hypocritical. Forthright and open and and and, and transparent, not occult and hidden. Min are dis misunderstood and persecuted better than being popular, fashionable and successful. 
challenging society. He says, I don't want to do good for, you know, the do-gooders for human, the humanists. I want to challenge society, not do good by giving them more comfort and more, uh, you know, putting them to sleep. The search for authentic humanity is his famous uberman, the, the, the overman, the superman. Society shouldn't exist for the sake of society, but only as a foundation scaffolding upon which a select species is being is able to raise itself, blah, blah, blah. You have all these on your thing there. A people is a detour of nature to get to six or seven great men, yes, and then to get around them. Don't worship whatever is happening. Keep going, you know, don't, don't stop. Man in himself, forget this. The last thing I would promise would be to improve mankind, because the improvement of mankind had come to be a silly, sentimental uh, thing. So. Uh, so I've, I've gone through all of this. This is simplifying and falsifying. You'll find this all on your sheets if you haven't. <coughs> Descartes, I think, therefore I am. That's a horrible simplification and falsification of a human being. Other things are there. <coughs> Augustine's abyss, insisting that we, we, you can only think of yourself in terms of the wholeness of yourself as memory, the wholeness of yourself as understanding, the whole yourself as will. This is an example of the abyss not one simple definition of the human being as a Plato or an Aristotle had given. Augustine went well beyond them in his view of man, if you ever took 202 or 205, and it was discussed there. Berdayev, the, 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 the Russian thinker, insisting on all this talk about are we free will or are we determined. He said, it's, Habibi, you don't, you don't argue about something that's obvious. We are, our obvious thing as a human being is that we're free, and we don't want the freedom. We'd rather be slaves. And that, that's so much, that's, that's a fact. That's not something you have to prove whether you're free or determined. If you're just living and watching yourself, your b biggest burden is the fact that you're free, is that you're responsible, is that you're accountable, that it's up to you to make life slavish or master. So uh, this is philosophy on a different level. This is philosophy not looking for, you know, for arguments and does this fit this and does this contradict this, but it's life philosophy. <coughs> Can you really say you're not free, that everything you're doing is just mechanical? Uh, you're just running away from responsibility. <coughs> Beyond categorization and the simplify-falsify thing and the aspectism, food for thought, what has he demolished? Are there any survivors of what he's attacked? Are there any predecessors? Do you, see that you find, I've mentioned uh, Socrates and Augustine and Kierkegaard, there are certainly others. Be, be, recognize any current arguments today in your own life, in your own society. What do you think Nietzsche would be attacking today? Because Nietzscheans today are still attacking the same things he was attacking in the 19th century. You know, as if nothing has changed. You know. uh, a Nietzsche would today want to be attacking what today is in power and what today is, has, uh, and this is the letter to the sister. Thank you.